Welcome back. Let's jump into the book of Judges. Now, Judges records the transition of leadership uh, through a period of time leading from Joshua to until they have a king uh, in Saul. We read about that in the book of 1 Samuel. In, in the book of Judges, it really makes no effort to cover up all of the issues that these leaders had, the flaws, the inconsistencies, the the the, the forsaking of God's laws, uh, it, all of it. And, and it says in your notes here, it shows the good, the bad, and in, in some instances, the really ugly uh, parts. And in all of it, in the book of Judges, this truth kind of resonates through. And that is that while God's people were unfaithful, God remained faithful to his covenant. Uh, the main lesson uh, in this book is that the consequences of what happens when there is no king and everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Judges 21, 25. And in this particular instance, it is not just the fact that they had no physical earthly king. It was that they had no oversight. They're, they had re rejected God as their king, even back in the, in the period of the Judges. Uh, the theme of the book of Judges is that there is a covenant-breaking people, but that we have a covenant-keeping God. And that as the people, uh, God's chosen people, they continually broke faith with him, broke covenant, and they went and worshipped the Baals and the Asherahs and all that stuff. And yet God remained faithful. And God continued to look out for his people. The big picture view of the content. I want to quickly look through chapter 1 with you of Judges. And um, so Judges ends where Joshua picked, where, or sort of Judges picks up where Joshua has left off. The very last part of the book of Joshua records his death. In fact, the same passage, the same wording even appears in, in Joshua as appears in Judges chapter 2. We're going to read that in just a second. So this period of time in chapter 1 is when Joshua is still alive. And he's telling the people to take, take the land. And there's something very interesting. And this is, kind of sets the tone for our understanding of the book of Joshua, or Judges. Uh, they went in and they said, well, who's supposed to go first? I said, okay, send out Judah. And then it goes um, tribe by tribe as they went into their allotment of lands. So remember, each tribe had their own allotment and they were to go in there and drive out the nations. Now I'll just start reading from 27. I'm just going to read the beginning of, of a couple of verses just so you get the, get the feel for it. Verse 27 says, But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shan, or Tanakh, or Dor. Next verse, or two verses later, 29. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer. 30. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in the Kitron. Um, verse 31. Nor did Asher drive out, right? Uh, verse 33, neither, neither did Naphtali, and it goes on and on and on. Neither did this tribe and this tribe. Not, none of them fully drove out the other nations as they were commanded to do. And then I want to go down to chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 6 um, through 11. And this is the section I just mentioned that's the same as the end of Joshua. It says, After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. <clears throat> Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. So, what it says is at the end that all the people follow the Lord as long as Joshua was there. And even the elders that he had appointed who outlived him, as long as that generation who was alive, the people of Israel followed after the Lord. Now let's read the next part, verse 10 and 11. And it says, After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. 
Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They arose the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. Another generation grew up who did not know the Lord. In other words, the very thing that this generation was supposed to do, to teach their children, to teach their children about who God was. Remember going back to the Shema, He is Israel, right? De- Deuteronomy chapter 6. To teach your children. And so when they ask these questions, you will be able to tell them. They failed to do that because a generation grew up who did not know the Lord. They hadn't even heard. Uh, they, 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 no, their parents had not taught them. And there was a whole generation that did not know the Lord. So what did they do? They did exactly what the curses, in, spoken by Moses and by Joshua, is exactly what happened. They served the Baals and the Asherahs because of the nations that they did not drive out, seduced them with their false idols, and it aroused the Lord's anger. And this begins this cycle of the judges. There is this complete religious and moral disorder that happens in the book of Judges. In fact, the book of Judges is, shows the depravity of man without God. As you read through, especially near the end of the book of Judges, it, it just gets heart-wrenching. Uh, some of the stuff that happens with this godless nation. Um, so what happens, what you see in the book of Judges is a cycle we call it the cycle of judges, cycle of sin. And six times throughout the book of Judges, you see this cycle happen. So let me just give you a, a kind of a, an overview of what that cycle is. It starts with, you know, it kind of goes around in a cycle. And it begins with um, the people of Israel, that they love the Lord their God, and they're following after him. And you have a generation that loves Jesus. <laughs> loves God. Um, Jesus hasn't come yet. Uh, they love God. They serve Him. But what happens is they did not teach their children. So the next generation that comes up is a generation who does not know the Lord. They do not know God. They do not know His decrees. And so what happens is they turn away from Him and they serve the false, false gods. And so they begin to serve false idols and it arouses the Lord's anger towards them. And so then God brings a foreign nation against them to oppress them. And this nation brings them into captivity and oppresses them. Uh, and they put them into slavery or whatever. And until the point where the people cry out to God and they say, Lord, we are wrong. They humble themselves and they cry out to him. Then what God does, is he raises up a deliverer. This deliverer comes. Uh, to lead them into victory. And God does an amazing victory, and the people return to the Lord, and they are a generation that serves God. They serve God, and they honor Him, and they follow His degrees, and they re-covenant themselves. But what they do is they did not teach their children, who worship the false gods, arouse the Lord's anger, and send them into captivity, until they cry out to Him, uh, and humble themselves. God raises up a deliverer, and saves them, and then they re-covenant themselves to God, but then they don't teach their children. And the cycle happens six times, over and over and over again. And you would think that they would learn from their own mistakes, but it happens six times. And each one of these uh, six cycles, um, the the person that God raises up is what we call one of the major judges, and there's six of them. But there are also 12 judges in all, because there are these other judges that kind of happen in between these times, like Shamgar, and uh, Tola, and Jer, and Abimelech, who is the anti-judge, who kills his 70 um, family members, Gideon, and anyway, you have all of, uh, all of this other drama that's going on in the book of Judges, but the six major, um, the six major characters in the book of Judges are Othniel, he's the first one, he's the first judge that we read about in chapter 3, and uh, then you have Ehud, and uh, it's a very interesting story, um, very graphic story. In fact, it's one of the things about the book of Judges. It's very graphic and gory, and it just it really gets down to the raw 
uh, and shows what people are like. Anyway, then you have Deborah, uh, an example of a woman put into a position of leadership uh, in the Old Testament. And Gideon, the one who was transformed he, from being this fearful, uh, hiding in his father's uh, grain press. And, um, and then God calling him out saying, you mighty man of valor, come. Um, anyway, it was this transformation of how God took this fearful person to lead God's people. Then you have Jephthah, I think one of the, sad, for me, the saddest stories in the book of Judges. And Jephthah um, goes to lead the people, and he makes this really rash vow to the Lord and says, uh, Lord, if you give me this victory, then whatever comes out of my door upon my return, that I will sacrifice to you. It, it's just... If you think this through, it is a stupid vow. What will come out of his house? Be a family member or something. And so the, 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 the vow itself is thoughtless. And then when God does give him victory and he comes back, well, who comes out of his door but his daughter? And he has pledged to the Lord that he would sacrifice whatever came out of his door. It's a sad, ridiculous story. But it reminds me of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Uh, verse 2 it says do not be too quick to utter anything before the God do not be hasty in your heart to make any vows or promises it says that God is in heaven and you are on earth so let your words be few and the heart of that is that don't be so quick to make a promise saying God if you do this then I'm going to do this uh, don't make these thoughtless vows and be qu quick in your heart because God will hold you accountable for what you vow to him and like with the story of Jephthah. But you know, it, it just shows the, the, the depth of depravity of people. That someone would even think that that was an okay thing to do. To sacrifice something that comes out of your door. Uh, that to be your daughter. I just, it's just, it's a sad picture of where uh, God's people have fallen to. And the last major judge in this cycle of judges is Samson. And Samson, again, is another sad story. Someone who God calls from birth. Uh, he was told that he had to complete what's called the Nazarite vow, which means that he wasn't to cut his hair, he wasn't to touch wine, or anything that was dead. Uh, that was what the Nazarite vow was. And so he was to be someone who was basically consecrated to the Lord for God's purpose. And as he went through his life and grew up, he discovered that God had given him great strength. Um, but he loved pleasure and himself more than God. God had a mission and a purpose for him, but he valued foreign women, basically. And all of his issues are around these foreign women that he pursued, um, which was, by the way, in violation of God's command. Do not marry, do not intermix with these foreign women. But he did. Of course, his story, right, with Delilah and then the cutting of his hair and the blinding and the, the again, very dramatic stories. The Book of Judges, I mean, it's better than anything Hollywood could ever produce. I mean, it, the Book of Judges is fantastic for that reading, right? It's just, it, it's, their stories are fun. Uh, maybe fun is the wrong word. They're interesting. They're adventurous. Um, but it also shows just such a the heart condition of a people who have lost touch with who God is and his decrees. Remember, this is only generations after the giving of the law, the establishing of the Levitical uh, priestly line, right? And the, in all of this stuff and the worship of God, everything that happened in the desert and as they've moved into God, into the promised land, they were set up for success. But they failed to drive out the nations around them. And so they were seduced by them. And they began to worship and fall away and how quickly they fall away from that. And then the book of Judges ends with, with this, chapter 21, verse 25, last verse of the book. It's also the verse we mentioned at the beginning of this section. It says, and, therefore, and Israel had no king, and so everyone did what they saw fit. They did what was right in their own eyes. And it was a, it encapsulates a book, a story. In fact, the last, even the last chapters of Judges uh, just show some more absolute depravity.
Um, but it just shows the people that are far away from God. So it's one of my favorite books because it's so it's so filled with action-packed adventures. It's, it's fun to read. And yet at the same time, it's absolutely heartbreaking to read um, about a nation, these nation that, that um, turned away from the Lord. Now, the book of Ruth was actually written right in the middle of the book of Judges. See, one of the nations that, that, that God had brought um, the people of Israel into uh, submission to, they were oppressed by, were the Moabites. And Moab was one of those nations that had positioned themselves against God. And, um, and so the story of, of Ruth is very interesting because it takes place in Moab, a, a, a nation that is, is detested by God's people. And yet, God had a plan, even in the midst of, of what was happening in the book of Judges, God was still at work. And even though all of the people of Israel had followed, uh, fallen away from excuse me, God's covenant and were doing things that were right in their own eyes, God was still orchestrating and he was still bringing about his plan of redemption for his people. And so the book of Ruth tells a story. It's kind of set as uh, almost like a stage play where this is this action and this dialogue that happens. But uh, this book is written to explain the validity of David's kingship as ordained by God uh, because he was a descendant of a Moabite. And so uh, when he when David becomes king, people could point and say, well, well, well wait a minute, he's a descendant of the Moabites. But the whole point of the book of Ruth is to show that it doesn't matter in God's in God's plan, in God's redemptive plan. He orchestrated this, and you can see it so clearly. Um, so God, the theme is that God uses a foreigner from Moab to be an example of faithfulness and trust in a time when Israel was not being faithful and not trusting God. So the big picture of the content is that it's the story of this young Moabite woman, a non-Israelite, who chooses to embrace the God of Israel. Naomi um, and her husband uh, had gone into Moab, Moab, the land of Moab, to escape the famine, the persecution, everything else that was going on in their land. Uh, and while there, uh, they took wives, foreign wives, which, by the way, was also um, condemned by God's law. They weren't allowed to do that. It's amazing how God still works in the midst of all of this, isn't it? Um, and so they went in there. Uh, they went to this land of Moab, Moab, and Naomi, her husband, uh, died, and so did her two kids, and leaving behind two daughter-in-laws, and um, Orpah and um, Ruth. And so Ruth decides, I'm, I can't stay here. I'm going to go back to my own homeland, and she does, and uh, Naomi does, and then Ruth follows her and says, "Listen, where you go, I'm going to go, and your God will be my God." In other words, I'm going to leave my family, my religion, my everything, and I'm going to be faithful to the covenant that I made to your son, and I will stick with you because as a widow, you don't have much of a hope, right? She herself is a widow. We're going to stick together because I trust your God. And she says, your people will become my people. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on this thing, and your God will become my God. And I really believe that that shows the impact of that Naomi had on her daughter-in-law, that she saw something different in Naomi. That Ruth saw something in her mother-in-law that inspired her. And I really, this is kind of a foreshadowing uh, of the Gentile inclusion that would happen uh, later on in the New Testament. When, when, when the promise that God made to Abraham that all nations would be blessed, uh, and the inclusion of the Gentiles that you see in the New Testament through the blood of Jesus Christ as part of God's covenant people. Now, this is this is the a kind of a foreshadowing of how God intends to have even the foreigners, even the Gentiles, to be included in His plans, His purposes. Uh, so, of course, they get back and they're not they're they're kind of in a, in a place of of between a rock and a hard place because they can't really work. The only work that they could find is gleaning in the fields, which, going back to our conversation about the law of God, that because there were certain provisions in the law of God for foreigners to be able to pick up wheat so they could survive, remember, uh, that was one of the things that they were able to do. 
and that God's law provided for a way to take care of the foreigners and the widows and so on. <clears throat> so Ruth found herself gleaning in these fields, uh, Boaz, which turns out to be a relative um, of, of Ruth's deceased husband. And so for Ruth to have any chance of her husband's line continuing, it had to be done by, we continue by a relative. And so we call that person someone who is a relative of the deceased husband who would step up and carry on the line uh, for that family. We call that a kinsman redeemer, one who would redeem uh, by paying the price to restore what was lost, in this case, the lineage. Uh, and this is really such a picture of Jesus, isn't he? He is the kinsman redeemer. He is the one who restores what was lost for us. And the, really the book of, of Ruth the center of it is, is that there is always hope. That, that's kind of the theme that runs throughout it. There's always a hope, even in, in the midst of a godless generation, in the midst of a godless nation that they had fled to, God still worked all things out for his purpose. And then the end of the book shows the genealogy from Ruth and Boaz to her great-grandson, David, the king of Israel. And that was really the point of the book of Ruth. And, of course, Ruth is also mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, the beginning of the New Testament. So, let's take a look at your assignment four here, student response required. Uh, what sticks out to you, for you most, in the story of Ruth? Through, through your reading and understanding, maybe through our discussion here, what are some things that stick out to you most about the story of Ruth? All right, let's jump into part three, the United Kingdom. We're going to be looking at the book of Samuel, first and second Samuel, uh, as it is in our canon. Uh, this is really the transition from a people who were a tribal nation ruled by judges to a monarchy. Okay, so they were uh, all of these different tribes that kind of had, had a relationship with one another, um, but they were mostly independently ruled. And now moving to a monarchy where they have one king over all of them. But really, it's a move from a theocracy to a monarchy. And a theocracy means uh, that where, where God uh, rules the nation, right, by representative. That's really what they're doing. They're moving from God leading the, land, the, the nation to asking for a man to lead them, uh, as we will see in this book. So the big picture view of First and Second Samuel is called Samuel. Because he's the first character that kind of begins the story. And typically in, in Jewish writings, this is what you would do. You would, you would call the book by the main character at the beginning. But as any astute um, scholar would, or you don't have to be that astute to figure out the fact that he dies in 1 Samuel. And there's a 2 Samuel after that. So uh, obviously there's there's not written by Samuel, but it's the story of Samuel. But this is really the book of the kind of a con, con, uh, con, what's the word a continuation into the book of Kings, right? Uh, it's the story of Israel, but it begins with Samuel, so we call it Samuel. So First Samuel begins with with Samuel, the story of how Samuel was born, um, and with Hannah's prayer, and then her her committing Samuel to the service of the Lord. And then in the midst of the beginning of the story, uh, we're introduced to the, the main character here. At the beginning of the story is a character called Eli. And he is the, the judge, like in the book of Judges, and he is the ruler um, and the high priest. But the problem was, he is not a spiritual man. Uh, when Hannah comes, you know, she's crying, says that he's sitting in his chair. And ironically, it's also where he dies, is sitting in his chair. Um, he just is kind of sitting around and his sons are, are wicked and evil and, and they are stealing from the, from the offerings that are given and they're doing all kinds of detestable things in the sanctuary of the Lord. And so his, his sons are evil, they're wicked, but he's not a spiritual man. Even with the calling of, of, um, of Samuel, when God calls out to Samuel. I mean, Eli, it takes them three times before he even clues in, oh, that could be God actually calling you. Uh, 
uh, he's just not really spiritually in tune, which shows that if even even the priesthood during the time of the judges had lost contact and connection with God. And so, but it begins with the calling of Samuel, and God has a point. He wants to do something new. And this is interesting because this is how God works. He calls people for his service. He calls people into this mission that he has for them. Um, it, It was not for Eli and his sons who were there because of birthright. God was calling someone after his own heart. And we see that again in the story of Saul and David. But God calls Samuel to be his representative to the people. And so he becomes becomes the ruler after Eli dies. Eli and his sons are are taken. And he becomes the ruler. And then during that time, there's the the Philistines steal the Ark of the Covenant. It comes back and there's this this great kind of coming back for the people of Israel. And, And the Ark of the Covenant is back. And right in the midst of this kind of victory that God brings to Samuel... It comes chapter 8, verses 1 to 2. Maybe I'll just read that real quickly to you. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 to 2. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. And the name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of the second one was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba, verse 3, But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribe and perverted justice. Such a sad commentary. Here's this man who loves the Lord, but again, his children did not follow. Either he did not teach them, or or they maybe made a choice on their own not to follow. But it's yet another generation that did not follow after the Lord. And so they did wicked. And because of that, the people didn't want them as their leaders. And Samuel's getting old, so they say to him, we want to have a king of our own. And so he says in verse uh, 6, but when they said, give, then they said, give us a king to lead us. And Samuel was just absolutely heartbroken because God said to them, in the wilderness, I'm taking you and you're not to look like the other nations around you. But the people of Israel said, Actually, what we want is we want a king because we want to look like the nations around us. We want to be like every other nation. We want to have a king. Samuel says, do you even know what you're saying? Do you realize that that there are consequences to this? And he's furious. And you know what God says? He says, Samuel, don't take it so hard. It's not you that they have rejected. It is me that they have rejected as their king. So he says, give them what they want. God sits back, and he's going to let them find out what it means to have a king. So he says, go ahead. You can have what you want. And so they have a king. And the king is Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses, or 1 chapter 8 through 15 talks about how, how they chose Saul as their king. He was tall, manly, handsome. His father, Kish, was a man of standing. Uh, You read about that in chapter 9. Perfect kingly figure, isn't he? He's a perfect king. He looks the part. He comes comes from a family with with good standing. And uh, he's got everything you need, right? There is your king. Uh, He even seems humble. Because, you know, when they go to to anoint him as king, he's, he's hiding. He... He's only hiding because of his own insecurities, which just gets magnified in, in a position of leadership. In fact, it's the story of Saul is a great lesson for us. What happens when we put people into positions of leadership who are insecure? Because insecurity only magnifies when in leadership, and it becomes manipulative. We see that uh, again all the way through Scripture too. We're going to look at that with Jeroboam as well. But those insecurities get magnified and did with Saul. And so Saul began to take things into his own hands. He performed duties that the priests were only for the priests. And God rejected Saul and said, because you did this, because you sacrificed and you took the position of a priest, I'm taking the kingdom from you. And God gave Saul another occasion, a specific job to do. He says, I want you to go and I want you to wipe out these people. 
And so he goes and he comes back. And as Samuel comes up to him, he hears the noise of sheep. And he says, what is it? I hear the bleating of sheep in my ears. And Saul's like, yeah, I did this great thing. Remember how God told me to kill everything? Well, guess what I did? I actually saved the best for him, so I brought it back. And Samuel's like, you know, God desires obedience more than sacrifice. And because you disobeyed, he was taking your kingdom away from you. And he's going to give it to another, someone who, a man who's after his own heart. And so then God says to Samuel, see, now the people of Israel, they had their chance. They had their king. They had it their way. They wanted a king like everybody else. They got that. But now I want you to anoint a king after my own heart. So he sends Samuel on a secret mission uh, so that King Saul doesn't know. And he sends him to the house of Jesse to anoint the new king. And Samuel, knowing what Saul looks like, he sees Jesse's firstborn son. He's like, oh, no, there, that, he looks like Saul. He's tall, he's strong, he's handsome. Goes to anoint him because certainly that's the guy. And God says, not him. All the way down the line of all of Jesse's sons. And then until there's none left. And Samuel's like, oh, do you have anybody else? Is this it? And Jesse's like, oh, yeah, there is one other one. It's, just, it's David. He's out in the field. He's He watches the sheep. That's like the, the lowest job. This is a job you give service, not to your own kids even. So he's watching the sheep because he's, he's David, you know. So bring him in. As soon as he came, God said, there's the one. Anoint him. And he was anointed. And, and the lesson here is that see, we look so quickly to the outside of people. We judge on how good someone um, appears, their education, how eloquent they are when they speak. Oh, they're so good at this thing. God sees through all of that. And, you know, he, and he chooses for himself. The people whose hearts he knows are his. Samuel is an example of that. Now David is an example of that. He chooses for himself men and women whose hearts are fully his. They're not always the prettiest, not always the smartest. Think about the New Testament. Jesus picked the disciples. They weren't very smart. But God chose them. Look at us, right? I'm so thankful that God doesn't choose based on our abilities because they're few and far between. God looks at the heart, and he equips those that he calls. You've heard that before. You know, he does not, he, he's not looking at what we can bring to the table. He's not looking at our intelligence or our abilities or anything that we can bring. He's looking for hearts that are fully his, that are obedient, that, that are ready to be formed and molded by him. Because all he wants from us is our obedience. And he takes care of the rest. And so God chose a man after his own heart, David. And David rose from a shepherd to the king of Israel. But you know why I think it's also important that God chose David, who his occupation was a shepherd? Because he understood what it meant to care about others. David cared for his sheep. And he, he's the one who wrote you know, in, in Psalm chapter 23, the good shepherd, he knows what it means to be cared for and the role of a shepherd in caring and protecting and providing. And so because of that, when he took over the kingship of Israel, uh, he looked at his people and he cared. And he knew that he was a man under authority from God and he led in such a way that was, that was full of humility and full of seeking after God. And, um, okay, let's look at the next part. Uh, student response, assignment chapter five. So the question is, what was the major difference between Saul and David? What was the major difference between Saul and David? In fact, there would probably be a number of these that you could talk about. And so let's take some time and think about that. And maybe I could add something to this assignment. As you're thinking about just Saul and David, think about your own life too. Where on this do you tend to fall? Do you tend to maybe fall on the Saul side about your abilities and, and looks and what's on the outside? Or on David's side? So maybe just do a little evaluation of where you are too.
uh, in that. Uh, let's look at the book of 2 Samuel. 1 Samuel ends with Saul dying. Of course, we don't have time to go into all of, all of this, but Saul, die, Saul and his son Jonathan die at the end of Samuel, 1 Samuel. And 2 Samuel begins with, with David now taking the throne. And he now becomes uh, king. And um, in the first five chapters, she talks about this journey from becoming the king who was anointed over Judah only to all of Israel. See, it didn't happen all at once. It's not like Saul died and everyone said, Hey, David is our king. Uh, Judah, the nation of Judah, said, Yes, David is our king. But there was also another rival in Ishbosheth. And there's the whole first five chapters talks about lots of characters. You know, the rise of, of Abner, who was trying to get Ishbosheth to be king over all of Israel. And then, you know, Asahel and, and Joab killing Abner. Again, like the book of Judges, first five chapters of Second Samuel are fun to read um, with all that's happening. But it's, it's in chaos. There's not a united kingdom anymore. It, the, the, the first five chapters, Judah's following, but the rest of Israel's not. It isn't until chapter five that he finally brings all of Israel together. and He is anointed king over all of Israel. And the kingdom is once again united. And in the midst of this, David has this plan. And he's like, I want to build a house for God. I mean, isn't it God, well, this whole time, God has been, since we left the wilderness, God has been in a tent. And David's looking, he's like, man, I'm living in this palace now. I have this, this palace, and I, I just feel like I should build God a palace. And so he goes and, and talks to the prophet, and he's like, yeah, do whatever is in your mind. And then the next day, God's like, ah, no, that's not how it's going to work. Go back and tell him. Uh, Nathan, go back and tell David, no, you're not going to build me a house. And so Nathan the prophet comes back and says to David, actually, no, God says you aren't to build him a house, but he's going to build you into a house. Interesting use of the word house and the word Beth is that he says you want to build God a house, but he wants to build you into a dynasty. In other words, you want to build a temple for God to be worshipped in. But he wants to create you into a, a lineage, a dynasty, because he has a plan. Of course, the plan includes the very the coming of the Messiah in, in many, many decades later, centuries later. As we call this covenant, God renews his covenant then with David. It's called the Davidic covenant. And it's, it's him saying specifically that I'm going to bring the Messiah through your lineage. And so I'm establishing you as a dynasty who will rule over the throne of Judah and Israel forever. I will always have one of your, your descendants on the throne. Of course, he's pointing to the coming of Jesus. And so that's called the Davidic Covenant. The next part of the story is, you know, David's going on through his life. We get to this chapters 11 and 12. It's a story of Bathsheba. And that was David's rebellion. His, his despising the decrees of God. And choosing pleasure over God's decrees. It all happens because here is David. It says, it says in chapter 11, In the days when the kings would go out to war, David stayed home. I understand from from ancient Near Age, uh, ancient culture that it was common in springtime the kings would just go out and have a war. A war. So I, I don't know why this would be the case, but the kings would go out to war, and I guess to push their own boundaries and agendas and whatever it is. But during this time, David said, "All right, okay, Joab, you go lead the armies. I'm just going to stay home and relax." And whenever we Stop doing God's work. Uh, we get ourselves to positions where we can compromise. And of course, it was during that time that he sees Bathsheba. He lusts for her. And not only that, but he takes her and then tries to cover up his sin by the killing of um, his, her husband. And 
because of this, the sword is brought against his household. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, just quickly look that up. Second chapter, chapter, Second Samuel chapter twelve. Uh, Nathan, of course, comes and rebukes David because of his sin with Bathsheba. Um, he says, "This is what the Lord says: Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. What you did in secret." You did in secret, but I will do this in broad daylight before all Israel. He said, because of this, oh, in verse 10, which I missed, Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. The sword will never depart, because you despised me and broke my laws. And because of this, what you did in secret, I'm going to do in full view of everybody else. And that's specifically, specifically talking about his son Absalom. In the next chapters, in fact, the very next chapter is the story of Amnon and Tamar. Amnon, um, half-brother of Absalom and Tamar, falls in love with his half-sister and is, is driven to rape her. And in the next chapters, David does nothing about it. He does nothing. And because of that, Absalom becomes furious. And so he vows to take matters into his own head. And so he, he does. And he eventually he kills Amnon. And then he flees for his life. And then he says, I'm actually, I'm so mad at my father for all that he's done. I'm going to take over. He comes back and he, he raids the city. David flees for his life. And Absalom does exactly what Nathan prophesied he would do. And he slept with his wives and concubines on, on the top of the house in front of everyone to say, look at me, I am now the king, and I am now the ruler. It's interesting because here is a man who's followed after God, who God chose to be the king of Israel because of the tenderness of his heart. And yet he falls into sin here, and then he is a terrible father. He, he fails to deal with what's going on in his own family, and because of that, it, it rises up. And eventually, he's, he abdicates the throne, uh, runs away from Absalom. Of course, God, Absalom is killed, and, and, and David reclaims the throne. And, but he's never the same. And the prophecy that, that Nathan gave him came true. And the sword never left his house. And he lived with that shame and that guilt for the rest of his life. And uh, at the end of his life, he, he, made, he made another critical error, uh, turning away from God and uh, turning away from the trust in God and took a census of the people to show his own might and God brought a calamity on the people. And yet, God talks about David as a man after his own heart. And you can see that when you read the Psalms. Because even though David made mistakes, failure as a father, um, committed adultery and murder, and, and brought a curse on a nation for his mistrust in God. Even though he did all of these things, he was broken and contrite, and he repented. Right after Nathan told him those things that were going to happen, he says, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Right away, when confronted with his sin, he was broken, and he said, I, am so, I have sinned. That's the difference. There are some great kings who did great things and made far fewer mistakes, but in their pride they would not repent and they would not turn back. And they, they justified themselves. And you see David is one who, when confronted with his sin, was broken. And that's what it means to be a man after God's own heart. Be a man who is humble and contrite and repentant. And you look through the book of Psalms and you see this. You see his heart just poured out before the Lord. And he was raw and open and, and, and so quick to, to admit when he was wrong and understanding of the punishment that he deserved. And so Nate, David is an amazing character in the Bible. Amazing 
person that God rose up as an example of what it means to follow after him. And it's a reminder that even when we fail, because we do, you know, we will, you will fail. Uh, we fail, hopefully not to that, to that extreme of David, but we do. We trip up. We make mistakes. And that God is never going to turn his back and reject us as long as we turn back to him and come to him with open hands, open hearts, forgiveness. Quick reflection here. And this is just a, a what if. If Jonathan was still around when David saw Bathsheba, what would have happened? Uh, of course, Dave, the throne belongs to Jonathan, so this is just a hypothetical thing. But it's interesting. Uh, David's involvement with Bathsheba began when he was at home instead of when he went to war. And he was not doing what he was supposed to do. And so kind of a, a thing to reflect on is what choices are you making in your actions and in your thought life that are putting you in places that make you vulnerable to temptation? Who do you meet with regularly that knows you well enough and loves you enough to ask you the questions to help you keep you accountable? I think if Jonathan was in David's life, he would have been, hey, why aren't you at war? Come on, man. What are you doing? He, he would have been there to keep him accountable. Who do you have in your life that keeps you accountable? I'm so privileged to have people that I have as my accountability partners. And just to be open with and to talk with them. Because we go through life and it's not easy. The, our enemy has an agenda. And when we try to stand and do that on our own, we are, we are prone to, or at risk of making the same mistakes that David made. But there's strength when we stand together. And so I encourage you, if you don't have somebody in your life who you can speak openly with about the things that are going on in your life, to do that before you go any further in your ministry. Find someone you can be completely open and honest with that can hold you accountable because there is strength when others are praying with you. Okay, 1 Kings. We're going to jump into 1 Kings. Kings, like I said, is a, kind of a continuation of the book of Samuel. And the first 11 chapters is the story of Solomon. Solomon is the, uh, the heir to the throne and is the last king of the United Kingdom. Um, I'm referring to British UK. I'm talking about uh, the first three kings united all of the tribes of Israel. So Saul, uh, David, and Solomon. <coughs> so this is the story of, of Solomon's rising to the throne. And... He becomes the king, and he has such a respect for his father that he saw how his father ruled the nation. And so when God came to him and asked him in, in a dream, what do you want? Ask anything of me and I will give it to you. I mean, he had the world laid before him. Solomon could ask for power. He could have asked for money. He could have asked for women. Those are the three big things that everybody, every leader wants, right? He could have asked for any of those things, but he said, no. Who can rule and govern this people of yours? Who can do it? I need wisdom. And God said, because you ask for wisdom and not for money and power or women or anything else, because you asked for that, I will give you everything. I will make you prosperous. I will make you the envy of the other nations. I will bless you. And so he, God gives him wisdom to understand. And he begins to, it's interesting, he has such a wisdom and understanding. It talks about him cataloging in zoology. I mean, he, he begins, he has such a mind to process and understand. And so God gave to him the blueprints for how he wanted the temple built. That's the first thing that he undertook is the building of the temple. The temple that David wanted to build him, God said, no, you're not going to build it, but your son will. And so Solomon builds uh, the temple for the Lord. And when it's finished, he consecrates it and he dedicates it to God for uh, the temple to the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 8. But with all of his wisdom, and he wrote the book of Proverbs uh, and, you know, in Ecclesiastes and all that, with all of his wisdom, 
he lost something. He lost that love for the Lord and the humility and the, the, the heart that David had, his father had, that, that heart after, after God. He lost that. And he got replaced with his own knowledge and his own wisdom, and he got puffed up. And so pride crept in. And then he began to, to pursue other things in life. And if you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, it talks about how he pursues everything. I mean, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, I looked for I looked for pleasure here. I looked for meaning here in life. And he looked everywhere else. And it talks about how he had he had um, through over 300 wives and 700 concubines. Um, and his wives led him astray. He, has, he married these foreign wives. Remember, just as, as in in the book of Joshua, uh, well, right from Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges, that you are to to expel and push out the foreign uh, nations, right? And, and what he did is he married all of those foreign nations, all those women. And the very, very thing that God said would happen to the people if they didn't drive out the nation, that their hearts would be seduced to worship idols, is what happened to what happened to Solomon. So he began to bring these women in, and these women came in and they said, oh, "You know what?" This is really nice here. It's really great. But see, Jehovah, Yahweh is not my God. I, I worship Baal at home. I I really would like to worship him here. And so Solomon would say, okay, let's build a temple. And so he be, pl- built places of worship for his wives so they could worship their own gods instead of worshiping the God of Israel. And so he brought that back into the nation. And then as he got older, his heart became seduced by these different women. And he began to go with them and worship at these different places. And his heart changed. He did not finish well. He started really well. He asked for wisdom. And somewhere along the line, he lost it. He stopped using it. He started relying on human understanding rather than on the wisdom that comes from the Lord. And so... During his reign, though, this kingdom was firmly won. It was at the height of glory. It was the most prosperous it had ever been. And it was firmly one nation. And when he died, he handed off the kingdom to his son. The same son, I believe, that he he wrote the book of Proverbs to. If you read the book of Proverbs, it says, Listen, my son, to my instruction. Listen to me, wise. Pursue wisdom and reject folly. And so he wrote, pleading with his son to pursue wisdom. But he didn't do it. And we'll pick up in our next session in part four.